بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم آله وصحبه ومن والاه أما بعد uh, First, before we get into any talk With this light here, I can't see anything, just to be honest with you. I don't know how Sheikh Ammar saw me come in, um, but, I, but I can't see anything. So, but, but I do need to notice, by a show of hands, are there any m people in the medical profession here, like doctors? Okay, have you ever had to go to the hospital for a procedure yourself um, as a doctor? Yes? How would you feel if you walked into the hospital for, you know, you're trying to go see the doctor? And then they say, oh, you're a doctor. We need you to work on some patients while you're here. That's how I feel right now. Uh, I didn't come here to talk. I came here to listen. Um, and it's important, alhamdulillah, that's great. It, it, it's important to know that all of us, the, these people who come up in front of you and they speak, all of us are servants of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala trying to nurture our own souls and trying to connect to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, which is the theme of this particular conference. And so, in, in keeping with that theme of connection to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, I'd like to share with you a very important dua of the Prophet alayhi salatu wasalam. Because the connection to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is never more prominent than it is in prayer. This is why Allah Azza wa Jal obligated upon us to do that which is most important for us, which is salat, in terms of connection with Him, subhanahu wa ta'ala. So it's obligated five times a day. And salat is built on a very important pillar in that salat, which is surah al-Fatiha. And Fatiha is a dua. Uh, again, Again, the dua is your connection with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the more you are remembering Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and calling upon him and asking for his guidance and asking for his favors, the more you will be connected to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So I want to share this dua with you. Uh, a companion, very famous companion, his name was Abu Bakr. What? Huh? Abu Bakr. Come on, front row, front row, don't worry about anybody else. Abu Bakr, what? Abu Bakr. No, Abu Bakr al-Thaqafi. Radhi Allahu ta'ala anhu. He, he had a son. Son's name was Muslim, Muslim ibn Abi Bakr. And he said, I used to hear my father at the end of the salat, he would say, Allahumma inni a'udhu bika min al-kufri wal-faqr wa'adhab al-qabr. He said, I used to hear my father say this all the time. And so I was in Salat one time without my father, and he came by and he heard me saying at the end of the Salat, Allahumma inni a'udhu bika min al kufri wal faqri wa adab al qabr. He said, So he came to me after the Salat, and he says, Ya Bunay, min aina khatta ha'ula il kalimat. Where did you get those words from? And he said, Ya Abata, akhattuha ank. I got them from you. He said, Felzem hunna. He said, Then stick to them, stick to those words. Because, Inni semitu Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam yadu biha fi dubri kulli salah. I used to hear the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam make dua with those words at the end of every salah. This dua. The translation of it is, Oh Allah, I seek refuge in you from disbelief, kufr, from faqr, poverty, and from the punishment of the grave. And if you can't memorize this in Arabic, at least memorize those meanings in English and say them at the end of your prayer, your salat, even if you have to say them in English, though it is better for you to learn them, in Arabic. Now, that being said, uh, it's important for us to understand the depth of what the Prophet ﷺ was actually seeking refuge from because it gives more meaning to the dua. And Allah does not accept the dua from a heart that is min qalbin lahin, 
يعني, uh, a heart that is um, uh, distracted and preoccupied. So if you don't know the meaning of what you're saying, most likely your heart is not going to be in it. It's very difficult to mean something and you don't know the meaning of it. I mean, I guess that's kind of pretty obvious. So the Prophet والسلام, here is seeking refuge. And a lot of us, we say, A'udhu Billah. But do we really know what al-isti'adha means when we seek refuge in something? So right now, in the United States, there's a, a crisis at the border, right? What, what kind of crisis is it? People seeking refuge. Refugees, right? So people seeking refuge. They want to take shelter in the United States and be protected from whatever it is that they're running from. So when you're, when you're seeking refuge with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you're seeking Allah azza wa jal's shelter. You're seeking his protection subhanahu wa ta'ala from whatever it is that it, this thing that, is, that you don't want in your life. So you seek refuge from that thing. And so the Prophet والسلام, would seek refuge in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala frequently from many different things. Here we have three things. The first of them is kufr. And kufr linguistically means a taghtiyah. It means to cover something. And I think the first time I realized that was when I was first started studying Arabic in the mid to late 90s. And I was in Medina at the time. And Mustawa uh, Thalith fil Mahad. And so the, the teacher was going around the room, he was asking the students to tell them something about themselves and their family. So the one, the one student says to the, to the sheikh, he says, Yeah, my father's a falah. What's a falah? Does anybody know? A farmer. Which, which, Totally side note, if you say hayya ala al-falah, huh? Okay. <laughs> Sorry, we'll get back to the point. So, so he says, yeah, my father's a, a farmer. So then the sheikh says, hey, uh, Abu Kafir, your father's a kafir. And we were all like, what? <laughs> no, really, that was like, that really, I'm telling you, I never forgot this lesson. So yeah, Abu Kafir, father's a kafir. Man, that was like, wait a minute. That's over the top. We can't do this here. I mean, you know, the, I think Dr. Abu Zaid talked about people insulting other people. I mean, that was, that was really insulting. So he says, no, a kafir is a farmer. Somebody who, why, why do they call a farmer a kafir? Because he, he puts the seeds in and he covers it, right? So kufr linguistically, linguistically means a taghtiya. And in fact, some etymologists claim that the word cover in English comes from kafara in Arabic. And, and there is a similarity. Allah knows best. Uh, the point here is, what does that mean for, for the believer when we say kufr? Uh, we obviously know that kufr is a rejection of faith, right? Or what we would say is disbelief. But some of the scholars say that the kafir was called a kafir because his heart was covered and, and iman was not allowed to, to penetrate that cover. And so we seek refuge in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala from disbelief. And when we seek refuge in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala from anything, then we're seeking refuge from that thing and those things that lead to it as well. And we have to be careful of that. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala did not just prohibit zina and adultery and fornication, but he taqrabu, don't go close to it. The means that lead to that are also forbidden. So when we think about seeking refuge in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala from anything, as you're making that dua, think about those things that lead to kufr, you're also seeking refuge in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala from those things. And your iman is the most valuable thing you have. Your iman is what defines purpose in life. And every human being needs purpose, which is why you find people, and it's really sad, it's really sad when you hear people say, I found my calling in life. I'm supposed to make people happy through singing. No, really. They, and they honestly believe that for four or five years or whatever it might. And they waste a large portion of it looking for their calling. As Muslims, wallahi, Allah Azza wa Jalla has blessed us 
because we know what our purpose is and we know what the end game is. A lot of people don't have that. And by leaving off faith and going down a path of disbelief, your purpose gets altered. And therefore, it messes with the psychology of the human being, subhanAllah. So when you, see, you seek refuge in Allah, subhanahu wa ta'ala, from kufr, from disbelief and everything that leads to that. And, and we have to realize that the things that lead to that in this society are many. I'm not going to go into, we don't have enough time to talk about all of these things. But just beware of everything that leads to kufr and especially those things that alter the identity of the Muslim, that, that play with the identity of your children, where they begin to think that there's another way that may be equal to or better than Islam. And that's what happens a lot of time when we throw them in the middle of the ocean of secular education and so forth, that it begins to reprogram or program them because maybe we haven't done our own job of teaching them the value of Islam. The du'a of Yusuf, alayhi salam, tawaffani muslima. Oh Allah, allow me to die as a Muslim. Wa alhiqani salihin. Put me in the company of the righteous. And we hear in every khutbah, Ya ayyuhal ladhina amanu taqullah, haqqa tuqati, wa la tamutunna illa wa antum muslimun. And don't die, except that you are Muslims. And so living as a Muslim, in submission to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we can't get away from submission. We will submit to something. The human being is frail. So we either are servants of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the one who created us, or we're servants of something else. And being servants of something else is kufr. So we seek refuge in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala from that. And by seeking refuge in that, you are implicitly asking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make your iman stronger. So Allahumma inni a'udhu bika min al-kufr. wal faqr. And I seek refuge in you from poverty. Poverty, by definition, both in English and Arabic, is to lack something, to be deficient in something. If you say this water, for example, is, uh, is poor of minerals or something like that. It doesn't have enough mineral poor. It doesn't have enough minerals. So when we say... That when, we, when we seek refuge in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala from poverty, this is two types. There is faqrul nafs wa faqrul mal. There is the poverty of the soul. And you, you, we actually use that, this terminology, by the way, in English. We say, oh, what a poor soul, right? Uh, you know, how, how poor this person is. But there's, there's poverty that is well known, which is that you don't have enough wealth, enough money, and there's poverty of the soul. And the Prophet Sallallahu here was seeking refuge from both, and Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Taala knows best. Poverty of the soul is to never be content. This is why the Prophet Sallallahu said, لَيْسَ الْغِنَى عَنْ كَثْرَةِ الْعَرَضِ وَلَكِنَّ الْغِنَى غِنَى النَّفْسِ That being rich being wealthy does not mean that you have a lot of materials, a lot of property, but it is the wealth of the soul, meaning that you are content with what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has blessed you with. That is real wealth. So you can imagine, and you probably know people like this. Tabarak Allah, they have a lot of money. They get a brand new car. How long are they happy with that new car? A month, two months, and then they're like, ah, yeah, it's okay, but I need another one. You don't need anything. But because your heart is attached to dunya, and it's attached to these material things, you feel like you need. So when you feel like you need something, then what? You're not satisfied. So you don't really, you have a lot, but you don't feel like it. And what is it that actually makes you happy? What you have or how you feel? Seriously. It's how you feel. And so a person who is content with what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given them, that person is rich because their heart is attached to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and Allah azza wa jal nourishes them and they don't feel the need for external you know, validation. 
And so that, that's the poverty of one's soul. And then there's really being impoverished in terms of wealth. And, and Ikhwan, brothers and sisters, don't take this lightly. The Prophet Sallallahu sought refuge with Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Taala from poverty because there is a correlation between poverty and violence. There's a correlation between poverty and bad health. There's a correlation between poverty and inadequate education. All of those things. Do you know how many people here in the United States of America live below the poverty line? Anybody? Huh? How much? 22%. 22%. About. In some big cities, 25% of the population live under the poverty line. And, you know, the fact that the Prophet ﷺ sought refuge with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala from poverty is important because it shows us that there's not a virtue. Some people believe this, by the way, that there's a virtue in being poor. There's virtue in being patient with your circumstances. But the virtue is because of the patience, not because of, of the circumstances. And so, as Muslims, we need to actively try not to be poor. Not so that we can have a whole lot of money to brag and boast, because the Prophet also, also sought refuge with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala min fitna til ghina, from the fitna of wealth. Because some people with their wealth, they become arrogant because they have wealth. And some people with their wealth, they brag and they boast. And some people use it. If they didn't have wealth, they would not be able to do some of the haram things that they do with their wealth. So wealth can also be a fitna. And the Muslim seeks that middle ground. And there were many of the companions of the Prophet ﷺ who were rich. And that was considered to be a fadl because they used their wealth to benefit Islam. So we want wealth so that we can benefit our deen. And so that we can leave something for our families as well. The Prophet ﷺ told Sa'd ibn Abi Waqqas, for you, radiallahu ta'ala, and for you to leave your family with wealth so that they don't have to yatakaffafu nas, yani, that they don't have to go out, put their hands out in front of the people. This is better for you than to give it all away as sadaqah. Okay? So, the Prophet ﷺ sought refuge with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala from al-faqr. And everything that leads to poverty, therefore, comes under that. And one of the main causes of poverty in the big wealth gap that we have here in the United States is inadequate education. And, and the, the, in fact, they call education the, uh, the great equalizer. And it doesn't mean that if you have a great education that you're necessarily going to be, uh, you know, well-to-do. And it doesn't mean that if you don't have a good education that you can't be like a very prosperous businessman. But education is key. And I think that, as a very side note, side note, I think that as Muslims, we have to create our own platforms about what we think is important. And not just align ourselves with the right or the left. Because the reality is, is there is no platform that exists right now that a Muslim can buy into wholesale. You look at the right, they don't want us. They don't. You look at the left, they want us, but only in as much as we will, you know, push their agenda, which may be against our own morality. But because they have accepted us and because we are a minority, and it's because we say, okay, okay, we'll play along. And it's not okay. We have enough of a minority, we have a critical mass, where we could create our own platforms. What if we as Muslims, did like Lyndon Johnson did in 1964 when he declared war on what? Does anybody know? I know some of you were alive in 1964. He declared war on what? On poverty. 55 years ago, when, the, when, the, when poverty had risen so much in the United States that 19% of the people were living under the poverty line. Well, here we are 55 years later after the war on poverty and we got 3% more. And he, in other words, he didn't succeed. He didn't do so well. But as Muslims, we could get behind a platform of a war on poverty that pushes better health care. Most of the middle class who have declared bankruptcy in this country do so because 
up for medical reasons. Medical bankruptcies have broken the middle class. And the majority of people who declare bankruptcy in this country is because of medical reasons or something related to it. So we could get behind a platform that pushes for better and, and more fair medical care, better education, those type of things. Because that is part of the Prophet Sallallahu dua, Allahumma inni a'udhu bika min al-faqr. A'udhu bika min al-kufri wal-faqr. The last thing that the Prophet والسلام, sought refuge in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala from in this particular hadith was adab al-qabr. Punishment in the grave. And again, when we seek refuge with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala from anything, we're also seeking refuge from him with him from those things that lead to that thing that we are seeking refuge from. And what is it that leads to, pu leads to punishment in the grave? Ibn al-Qayyim, rahimahullah ta'ala, uh, he gives us a very comprehensive answer. And he says that there are three things. Al-jahl billah, wal idha'a li amrillah, wal tikab ma'asi. In other words, ignorance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, neglecting to fulfill his commands and doing those things that he has prohibited. So we have specific hadith about people who have been punished in the grave, but that is the ultimate, you know, uh, summary of it. How do you not get punished in the grave? You know who Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is and you connect with him. And you fulfill his commands and you stay away from his prohibitions. If that is the case, then you will be like that Muslim who though the hereafter is a very scary event, if I can use that term, a very scary stage. But for those who fulfill Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's commands, they will be like the one who in his or her grave, a person will come to them, Hassan al-Wajj. Hassan al thiyab Tayyib al rih This person is, he has a nice face, handsome, wearing nice clothes, and from him emanates a great smell. And he says, Men ent, who are you? And he says, Ana amaluka salih. I am your righteous deeds. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make us from amongst those who remember him kathiran, to remember him a lot, subhanahu wa ta'ala. I implore you to memorize this dua, Allahumma inni a'udhu bika. You, you all know that, so I want to hear you say that. Allahumma inni a'udhu bika. Everybody knows that? Oh Allah, I seek refuge in you. Min al-kufr wal-faqr wa'adhab al-qabr. Say that at the end of all of your prayers, and, be, and think about what you're saying before you do tasleem. So after you, as the Prophet ﷺ taught Ibn Mas'ud, at the end of your tashahud, and at the end of the sending the salah and salam upon the Prophet ﷺ, فَيَتَخَيَّرْ ثُمَّ يَتَخَيَّرْ مِنَ الْمَسْأَلَةِ مَا شَاءْ Then let him choose from dua whatever he likes to say. Make sure you say this dua. اللهم إني أعوذ بك من الكفر والفقر وعذاب القبر سبحانك اللهم وبحمدك شهر الله إلا إلا أنت استغفرك وأتوب إليك. بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم